and fighting our battles every knee will bow before him and our God is the Lamb the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb oh, every knee
A couple of weeks ago, Hannah taught us a portion of the song in Spanish as a way to celebrate God's heart for a diverse and beautiful family. We want to revisit that today in the same spirit. So in a moment, Hannah will walk us through the phrases once again, and you can join in and sing with us in Spanish, or you can just sit back and soak in the beauty of Spanish worship. For me personally, I, I've experienced this amazing power of the cultures gathered together in love and unity and worship, and you can't help but feel the, the love, the, just the, the goodness of God. The, it's hard to put into words this we're all connected, this beauty of togetherness, the delight of the Father. 
And so let's enter into that together. Hannah, thank you for leading us. All right, so I'm going to invite you to repeat after me as we say each phrase. Milagroso. Abres camino. Cumples promesas. Luz en tinieblas. Mi Dios. Así eres tú. Let's try to sing those words together. Milagroso. Milagroso. Abres camino. Cumples promesas. Luz en tinieblas. Mi Dios. Así eres tú. Milagroso. Milagroso. Abres camino. Cumples promesas. Luz en tinieblas. Mi Dios. Así eres tú. Try singing with me. Milagroso. God, you and you alone are faithful. That you are here and that you are moving in our midst in spite of us. God, that regardless of what we do, of how faithful we are to you, God, you love us and you desire to meet us in a space of your presence, a space of relationship where we can know you and be known. God, would you help us internalize and believe these words that we've sung? Would we truly walk and live in the full knowledge that you are a miracle worker? God, that you are light in darkness. And that God, light always shines through. Father, we love you. And all God's people said, amen. difficulty on my bad. But <laughs> welcome to Blackhawk Church. Um, we're glad you're here. I'm glad you can hear me. I'm glad that that's working. Now, uh, you might feel like you're all alone in your apartment or your home, and it's you on your device or with your roommates or friends or whatever you're doing this morning, but you got to know you're not alone. You really aren't. Like right now, there are literally thousands of people tuning in from all over the world, and we're watching right now. And, you know, we're not just connected by the internet. We're connected by something inside of us that longs to know and experience God, right? And so God is, he's here and he's there with you right now too. So just sort of like, you know, take a deep breath and sort of sit back and sit back into that and know that he wants to meet with you this morning. 
Well, we're in a minute, we're gonna go uh, to Pastor Chris and he's gonna take us through the next little series, the next stop in our series on Galatians in the book that saved the church. Now, many of you, we've been hearing online have really been digging into this. You've been cracking open your Bible and you're studying and you're reading. There's about 700 folks who've registered in our, on our weekly webinar that Charles is leading to go real deep into the book. We've got um, a podcast that you can tune into that people are taking advantage of. But one thing you might not know, for your own personal reflection, uh, there are reflection questions on our website that our life group use, but also that you could just use for yourself. So as you're going through the book and maybe just want something just to sit and think about, you can use those questions. Uh, and I think they'll be a real help for you as you go. Well, let's not wait any longer. Uh, Pastor Chris is going to take us deeper and expand our vision a little bit as we dig into the next stop on the book of Galatians, the letter that saved the church. Hey, welcome Blackhawk Church. Uh, great to be with you. Thanks for joining us uh, online. Those of you who are part of Blackhawk Chinese ministry, Di Zhang Zimei Ping An. Well, you know, you don't have to have come to Blackhawk uh, very long to know that one of the things that I just love to talk about is uh, the night sky. Man, I just love to talk about uh, the stars. So if uh, one night uh, this week, uh, you could go out and just look up on a clear evening. If you crane your head like this and you're kind of looking towards the south, you would see a really huge constellation. It's really easy to see. It's called uh, Orion. Orion uh, is, uh, is the hunter, uh, ancient, uh, ancient constellation. If you look in your Bibles in the book of Job, in the book of Amos, it mentions uh, Orion. And so it's really easy. You could be, you could actually be in Target. And, uh, you know, with the, the parking lot lights on, you can actually still see uh, Orion. I actually they did that the other night. So it's really huge, and it's easy to see. I love there's an orangish kind of a star to, the, to the, the, his shoulder, and it's, uh, it's, it's called Beetlejuice. I just love this. Can you the name of a star? It's called Beetlejuice. I just love saying that. Beetlejuice is a red giant. So like if the center of Beetlejuice was where our sun is, the diameter of Beetlejuice is, uh, it would encompass the Earth's orbit around the sun. <laughs> That's like a really, really big star. Okay, so there you go. That's Beetlejuice. But the star I want to talk about today is uh, this star. It's called Sirius. And it's also called the Dog Star. And for us in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, Sirius is the second closest star that we can see with our own eyes. That's a good test question, isn't it? What would be the closest star that we can see with our own eyes in the Northern Hemisphere? It would be... No, it's the sun. Yeah, the sun. That's a trick question. That's also a, a star. So anyway, so the question today is... How far is Sirius, like one of the closest stars to us, how far is Sirius from us? Well, it's nine light years. Okay, well, what's that uh, actually mean? Well, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. That means if you were on a rocket ship that went the speed of light, that would go around the equator seven and a half times in one second. That's the speed of light. So um, let me, let me uh, use uh, the ping pong ball would represent like... Uh, the sun, our closest star, and then the tennis ball would represent Sirius. And for scale, this is about right because Sirius is larger than the sun. So let's say that I would put the sun right here. So where would the earth be traveling the speed of light from the sun? The earth would be, and I measured this out beforehand, the earth would be over here 13 feet and then I would put a little speck of dust, a little speck of dust, and that would be the Earth, 13 feet. So the question is, nine light years, where do I put this? Where, where do I put Sirius? Do I put it like at the edge of the auditorium? Or do I maybe put it like, uh, you know, maybe out there on Mineral Point? Do I put it out there? Do I put it, like, where would I put this? A couple of miles away? Ten miles away? Where would I put it? Nine light years. I would put it in... 
Naples, Florida, that's where I would put it. That represents nine light years, given uh, this scale, 1,400 miles. Isn't it like, isn't it like blows your mind, doesn't it? I mean, to think that we can even see it when it's that far away. And that's one of the closest stars uh, to us. The sky is filled with so many amazing, the, the galaxy, you guys, the universe is just mind-boggling. Scientists tell us if you go out at night on a clear night, like away from Target's parking lot, and you look up, you might see the Milky Way galaxy. That's our galaxy. And in our galaxy alone, scientists tell us, they don't know exactly how many stars there are, but scientists tell us it's something like 100,000 million stars in just our galaxy. That's a funny number. I have no idea. Like, what, what is that? What does that mean? 100 thousand million and our galaxy is just one of a hundred billion galaxies <laughs> i mean help me so help me i mean like that is just like unbelievable and the bible says that our god created all of those galaxies. You know, sometimes I run into people who go, I don't know if God can do that. It's, I don't know if he, if there's something that's going on in my life right now. I don't know if God can do that. It's, you know, I run into people like that. They think it's, they're, they're running into something that's too big for God to handle. And he created all of that. You guys, listen. If the first verse in the Bible is true, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, everything else is a piece of cake for God. Unbelievable. When I look up at the starry sky, I'm reminded of how big God is. And not only how big God is, but how big God's family is. Because uh, one night, about 4,000 years ago, God takes a guy named Abraham out to the night sky and says to Abraham, Look up. And Abraham, being like the northern hemisphere, looked up and saw something like that. And God said to Abraham, so shall your offspring be. That's an amazing promise. What that means is that if we have placed our faith in the Messiah, we are one of Abram's offspring. Or as the songwriter Rich Mullins wrote a long time ago, it's like God lit one of those stars for us. God's family, Abram's family, is so massive. It's unbelievable. That's what we're going to talk about uh, today. So grab your Bibles or your devices and uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3. And I've got to get rid of a series here. So I think I'm going to throw it to somebody that's in the audience right there. There we go. All right. Galatians chapter 3. Here we go. This is the fourth in a series of nine messages. How are you guys doing? I'm a little excited right now. So we're going through this series, and this series is called Galatians, the letter that saved the church. This is the fourth in a series of nine messages as we go through this. And what we've been doing, I don't have time to summarize everything that we've been doing so far, but Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians, and he's a little mad as he writes it because People in Galatia were led to Christ by the Apostle Paul. And then these Jewish Christians came in and they said to the Gentile converts in Galatia, oh, no, 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 no. You're not really a Christian until you become ethnically Jewish first. Like you've got to be circumcised. You've got to obey all the food laws and stuff like that. And they thought, oh, well, maybe, maybe we should. And Paul hears about that and he sits down and fires off this letter. He's like, you got to be kidding me. That's not true. That's basically the letter of uh, Galatians. And Paul is in a section right now where we're getting kind of to the heart of his theological argument. And what he's going to say in chapter 3 is uh, this. Heck no, those guys are wrong. I mean... <laughs> Your own experience should tell you that they're wrong because you received the Holy Spirit, right? Without doing all that other stuff. And the scriptures themselves tell us that those people are wrong because you're children of Abraham because of your faith in the promise. 
So this is a hard talk uh, today, and it's a hard talk for a couple of different reasons. The first reason is because chapter 3 is soaked with Abraham. And uh, we've heard of Abraham, but we don't know that much about him. And uh, so that kind of puts us at a disadvantage. His audience knew more about Abraham than we do. And the second reason this is a hard talk is because none of us uh, share the problem that he's actually addressing. That is, none of us have said, well, I, I wonder if I have to ethnically become Jewish in order to become a Christian. That's not, this just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because Galatians, it was successful. <laughs> Paul convinced people, no, 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 you don't have to do that. So it's a hard talk because it doesn't seem like it relates to us at all. It's about this guy named Abraham. So hang in there with me because I think we might see something today that could surprise us. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, see how mad he is, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain... So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? See what Paul is trying to do here in this section? Look back again at these, uh, at these verses. What is he talking about? He's saying that you receive the spirit by believing what you heard, by beginning, by you, you, you're beginning your life because the Spirit has come upon you. You've received the Spirit. Your life has been transformed by the Spirit. And how did you get the Spirit? By obedience to the works of the law? No, by believing what you heard. And, well, what they hear? They heard good preaching. <laughs> That's what they heard. Look at Galatians 3.1 again. Galatians 3.1 goes like this. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now, what does he mean by that? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as possibly referring to his own preaching. That's what he's doing here. And he's talking about, he, he didn't have a slide presentation. He didn't show them a video. He's talking about his preaching. And when he was preaching, he preached the cross of Christ in such a way that it was, it was like Jesus is portrayed as being crucified. These people didn't see Jesus die on a cross. Galatians is far away from Jerusalem. Remember the map? There's the region of Galatia. Here is Jerusalem. They didn't go down there to see Jesus. They knew Jesus died on the cross because Paul was preaching the gospel to them. So let me just talk a little bit about that for just a second. Gospel preaching has at its center the cross of Jesus Christ. The very center, the very core of the good news is the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the gospel. The gospel is not something that you do Remember that passage is something that you hear, you heard. They, he proclaimed the cross of Christ. So they, they heard that. And the gospel preaching changes in its form, as we see in the New Testament. Sometimes Paul refers to the cross, sometimes he doesn't refer. In fact, in this very book, in Galatians 1, verse 4, he talks about Jesus, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil. Well, he doesn't say the word cross here, but he's referring to the cross. In 1 Corinthians 15, we see another summary of the gospel. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Again, he doesn't use the word cross. All I'm trying to do here is just to say that 
gospel preaching takes different kinds of forms. The very heart of it is the cross. But it doesn't mean you have to mention the cross. But it's the very center of it. Sometimes at Blackhawk Church, we talk about the huge scope of the good news. Sometimes we start in the very beginning, something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and one of the good things that God created was human beings, and one of the good things God created in human beings is freedom. He gave people a choice, and they chose not to follow God. Instead of wiping out the human race, God decided to rescue them, and to rescue them, he chose one person of all the people of the world, and that person was Abraham. And out of Abraham's family would come the person who would rescue and restore all things to God. And the rescuer is Jesus Christ. But because Jesus was God himself when he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, demonstrating that he was more powerful than sin, death, and Satan. And one day, Jesus will return and will restore all things to the creator perfect way that whole story there is the gospel it's good news but the core of that is the cross of christ that's the core of the gospel and paul knew how to preach that and he preached it in such a way that they could like see christ if you're interested in adding to your library there's a good book on the cross of christ and and it's called the cross of christ by john R.W. Stott, That's a, I think every Christian family ought to have this in uh, their library. Really great book on the theology of the cross. So let's go back to chapter 3. So the, the situation is this. Oh, do I have to do the works of the law, become ethnically Jewish in order to become a Christian? Oh, my gosh. No, 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 no. You guys should know that yourself because of your experience. You received the Holy Spirit. And I'd love to talk more about the Holy Spirit and his person. But because of our series and the time left on the clock, I'm going to talk more about the Holy Spirit when we get to chapter 5. We'll do that. And actually, uh, in the webinar, which is uh, tomorrow night, a Monday night, you can watch uh, Charles Yu, and he'll talk more about the Spirit. But let's just keep moving in chapter 3. Keep it moving. So now he gets into, oh, your experience should prove that you don't have to become ethnically Jewish because you guys have received the Spirit. And secondly, that's not what the Scriptures teach. You guys, you guys are part of Abraham's family. And so now we read in chapter 3. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, that's like the Galatians, by faith, and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. Here's the gospel in advance. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So here he's talking about if you've placed your faith in the Messiah, you are one of Abraham's children. You are also a part of the promise. That's nothing to do with obedience to the law. And he builds and develops this argument and he compares and contrasts it with the law in uh, much of chapter uh, 3. Let's just look at a couple of paragraphs really. Oh, I know you can't read that, <laughs> but my point is this. I just want you to look at all of those yellows. That's Abraham. Abraham, 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 Abraham. And then Abraham, and then promise, promise. Abraham, promise, Abraham, promise, promise, promise. So what he's doing here in this section is he assumes they have knowledge of Abraham and the promise that God gave to Abraham. He bases his whole argument off of that. Now, here's my problem as a speaker. I, I think um, most of you don't know about that promise. You're, uh, you've heard about it, and you know he's, he's probably important. But to say that Abraham is probably important in the Bible. is like saying Aaron Rodgers is probably important to the Packers. I mean, you know, it's not, 
He's a franchise player. Abraham's a franchise player. And so uh, to, he's just so important, you guys. I mean, to do a little commercial for a friend of mine. Abraham is um, so important that three major world religions trace their origin stories back to him. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. There's an excellent little book about this. And it's by this uh, guy named Chuck Cohen, Charles Cohen, Abrahamic Religions, very short introduction, Oxford University Press. Oxford University Press has a bunch of these little very short introductions. They're all fantastic, and they're really short. Chuck Cohen is an emeritus professor in the history department at UW, and I've known him for years. This is a wonderful, wonderful man. And just by picking up this little book, you can learn a lot about Abraham and these other three major world religions. I recommend that to your attention. So this is what I want to do. I want to do a little crash course. Is that okay? Doesn't matter, I'm going to do it anyway. I want to do a little crash course on Abraham. And uh, let's go back to the promise. Maybe that'll help us make sense of what Paul's doing in Galatians chapter 3. So if we took our Bibles and we go back to a promise given to him, we go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And we'd read this. The Lord, and remember when you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in capital letters like that, it's the tetragrammaton. It's the personal name of God. And his personal name is Yahweh. So I'll see if I can translate it that way. Yahweh had said to Abram, his name gets changed later in Genesis. Right now it's Abram. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as Yahweh had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. And I just turned 65. He's 10 years older than I am. He's like way into his retirement. And this is when the promise happens. What's God saying here? Let's look back at this passage. He's saying this. I will make you into a great nation. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, Abram is married to a woman named Sarah. And they have no children. At 75 years old, they have like no children. And yet, he's going to have, like, children and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through. He's like, what? I don't even have any kids. So year after year after year goes by. And funny, he's in the mid-80s. He's in his mid-80s, and he just decides to take things into his own hands and decides that he's going to take one of his servants, Eliezer of Damascus. He's going to make him his heir. We read that in chapter 15, verse 1. After this, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in the vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Yahweh, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the night sky and count the stars if you can, indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed Yahweh, credited it to him as righteousness. Yahweh takes him by the shoulder, takes him out into the night sky, and they look up. And what do they see when they look up? They see something like this. All the stars, man. God, look at that. Try to count those, would you? Yeah, there's a hundred million thousand. You know what I mean? What? So shall your offspring be. What does the text say? Abram, what? What did he do? He believed Yahweh. He credited him as righteousness. What, what, what is this? What, is it, what does he mean? He believed Yahweh. 
he believed that God could keep his promise. And not just the promise that a barren couple is going to like have a child, but that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. So you read that in Genesis 18, 18. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful man, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. What an amazing promise. And Abraham demonstrates faith, and he says, oh, I believe that. And Yahweh credits him as righteousness, which basically means, yeah, you're my kind of guy. You're my kind of guy. And the promise was not just that he had kids, but that the whole world, all the world would be blessed. All the nations would be blessed. All the peoples would be blessed through him. So let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. So also Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abram. Here's the announcement of the gospel. All the nations of the, will be blessed through you. That's really good news. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abram, the man of faith. You do not have to be obedient to the ethnic Jewish customs. You do not have to be obedient to the, to the law. You don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to do the food laws. No, no. If you place your faith in, in Yahweh, what Yahweh can do, and he can bless all the world through Abram's seed, yes, you are a child of Abram also. The logic goes something uh, like this. God says to Abram, a descendant of yours will find a way to make the whole world right. All the nations will be blessed through you. Paul is saying to the Gentile Galatians, if you believe that Christ can make the world right, you have the same faith as Abram. You are a child of Abram. Another way of saying that would be to say this. You do not have to be ethnically Jewish to be a child of Abram. If you believe in Christ, you are one of those stars in the heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. At the end of chapter 3, he summarizes his argument by writing this. Galatians 3, 29. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Whenever you touch this thing, you make a mark like that. Well, at any rate. Lessons for our lives. That's interesting, Pastor Chris. A little bit of history there. Didn't know that much about Abraham. So, okay. Well, that's kind of cool. But, like, what does that have to do with life today? Really? I mean, really? I think the huge lesson for our life is this, is that God's family is like a really, really big family. It's like really, really big. And when you place your faith in Christ, you become a part of a multi-ethnic family that you cannot even imagine how big it actually is. Let's go back to the Galatians again. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abram all nations will be blessed through you. This word for nations in uh, Hebrew, in Genesis 18, goyim. In Galatians 3, it's ethne, and it means nations. It means ethnic groups, different kinds of people groups. When we read uh, in the book of Revelation, we read um, this great uh, passage John sees this vision of all these people, and we read this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Does that remind you of anything that nobody could count? From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne 
and before the Lamb. As you read this, it's like John is struggling with what words to use here. Like nation, tribe, people, language, all these different kinds of groups. And these different kinds of groups are diverse. They don't meld into one big group, or if they do meld into a group, it's like one tribe of many tribes, and many peoples, and many languages. It's a tribe of tribes. It's not a tribe of, and then everyone's melted together. No, no, it's, it's a tribe of different kinds of groups, different people groups. Look at this photo. I, uh, I thought this, this is like stock photo that we got like from Google. I thought it was cool because it looks like the stars, doesn't it? It looks like the stars. All kinds of different people from different backgrounds and different places. And that's the lesson for our lives. You become a child of God. You place your faith in Christ and him alone for your salvation, what he did for you on the cross. You become part of a huge multi-ethnic family that is just massive and massive and massive. Now, it's kind of popular uh, in uh, uh, maybe London, <laughs> uh, maybe New York, maybe Madison, uh, to say that, you know, Christianity is dying out. It's dying out. It's getting smaller. Hey, I could take you to a church building that's closing down now. And that may happen especially right after people come back and COVID's over. And people go, you know, I think Christianity is dying. That'd be hard to convince someone in Nairobi, Kenya, or, or Seoul, South Korea, that Christianity is actually dying because over there, they're trying to build buildings big enough to house tens of thousands of people who come to worship. When we think that Christianity is dying, it's a very small, it's a kind of a hazy understanding of what's going on in the globe today. I mean, globally speaking, from the West's perspective, Christianity might be getting smaller. But globally, Christianity is growing. It's massive. It's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Mark Knoll writes this. This past Sunday, it is possible that more Christian believers attended church in China than in all the so-called Christian Europe. This past Sunday, more Anglicans attended church in each of Kenya, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda than did Anglicans in Britain and Canada and Episcopalians in the United States combined. Mark writes, this past Sunday, more Presbyterians were in church in Ghana than in Scotland. The church is growing and growing, becoming more and more. It's just massive, massive, massive. But sometimes in the West, we, we don't have a clear view. It's like looking at the night sky in a Target parking lot. It's like we don't really get a good view of what's happening. But if we kind of got away from our little area and we looked up, we would see that it's just massive. And God wants his people to be a part of a tribe of tribes. You guys, listen. Getting all of these ethnic groups together is something that only God can do by the power of the gospel. Politicians and world governments have been trying to put people groups together and it's, it's never succeeded. God's, God wants all of the world to come together. And it's not a melding where they lose your ethnicity. ethnicity. You keep your ethnicity. You keep your language. And you're a tribe of tribes, but you're not tribalistic. Nobody thinks one tribe is more important than any other tribe. It's a beautiful, multi-ethnic, diverse, massive kingdom of God. God's vision is massive. Massive. <laughs> God's plan is massive. God's passion is massive. And it's good for us to remember that, that we're a part of it because of God's grace. And as we make plans about the future, it's important for us to remember that God's vision is multi-ethnic. 
It's important for us to remember that as we strategize in our tiny little church of Blackhawk, in a small corner that we call Madison. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. I just thank you so much for the diversity of your kingdom. Thank you so much, Father, for the, the, the vision of so many people, so many different kinds of people coming in to become a part of your family where, where it's a tribe of tribes, all these different tribes, and no tribe is better than any other tribe. All this rich diversity. We pray, Father, that you would help us as we, as we place our faith in Christ to remember that our tribe is, is no better than anybody else's tribe. It's not unusual if we don't know very many people in very many other tribes and we're just in a little corner of the world. But that we would remember your plan is is bigger than we can fathom. Forgive us, Father, when we just think our little corner is the whole deal. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be about your vision, your plan, your mission. We thank you for your grace. That's the only way we're a part of it. And we pray these things in Christ's name for the sake of his reputation. All God's people said,
reminder, right? That there is a great God over all the universe and he sees you and he sees me. And we just get to come and worship him. But we don't do it alone. We do it in a great, big, diverse family. After this benediction, we're gonna, you're going to have a chance. There's going to be some questions that come up on the screen. And I encourage you just take, even if it's like 30 seconds, to read them, maybe you discuss them, think about them, but just let it kind of stir around in your head just a little bit before you move on with the rest of your day. But uh, why don't we right now just kind of breathe deep and lift your head for this benediction. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God and Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work. May the blessing of this God be upon you now and always. Amen.